At the beginning of a conversation about drowning, it's important to clarify the terminology that we're going to use. The definition of drowning is the process of experiencing any degree of respiratory impairment following a submersion or immersion in liquid. Importantly, there's nothing in this definition about a patient dying or this being a fatal process. This means that drownings can actually be both fatal and non-fatal. Understanding this definition, some of the terms that we've historically used to define drowning actually don't make any physiologic sense, and we shouldn't be using them moving forward. Some specific terms that we should not be using include near drowning, delayed drowning, wet drowning, or dry drowning. Terms that we can use to describe drowning are fatal drowning, non-fatal drowning, and we can also talk about a primary drowning or a secondary drowning. And the distinction here is a primary drowning is the only issue at play affecting the patient is the drowning episode itself, whereas a secondary drowning, there's another medical condition which led to incapacitation in or around water, and then the drowning happens secondary to that primary medical issue. It's worth taking a minute to consider the epidemiology of drownings because the different groups who experience drownings will have different causes that led to it and it will affect our care a little bit. There's a trimodal distribution to patients who have fatal drownings in Canada. The first group is young children aged 1 to 5 years old. And in this group, the drowning is almost always a primary drowning and there's no other medical cause contributing. The second group is 15 to 25 year old males. And these are drownings that are normally secondary to testosterone, which means these patients are often undertaking high-risk activities. They're putting themselves into situations that are outside of their control. They're often experiencing trauma in or around water, which leads to their incapacitation and a secondary drowning. And there's often intoxicants involved as well. The third group of individuals are an older demographic of aged 55 years and older, and there's more of a presentation of males than females in this group as well. Again, in this group, it's less likely that it's a primary drowning, and what we see more is a secondary drowning, where the primary issue is a medical issue, and the most common medical concern is an acute coronary event. In fact, looking at patients who have fatal drownings in Canada, and individuals aged 65 years of age and older, more than half of the individuals who have a drowning, there's some type of cardiac component to the presentation that led to a drowning. So for seeing patients coming in in this demographic following a drowning, we want to be much more suspicious that there's an underlying primary medical issue. In terms of what happens during a drowning itself, the first thing that happens is that water enters the upper airway and then hits the larynx. And the larynx is going to go into a reflective, protective laryngospasm, which is actually quite effective at preventing most water from getting down into the lower airway. In patients who have a minor, non-fatal drowning, their only symptom may actually be a temporary, self-resolving laryngospasm. And then after a couple seconds, that breaks and they're able to clear their airway. And then that drowning episode is over. In more severe, higher-grade drownings, some water will get past the larynx, and that water in the lower airway is going to cause bronchospasm, and then down in the alveoli, it's going to cause direct cellular injury to the thin, fragile alveoli walls, and it's going to cause surfactant washout, which is a really important component of the drowning process. We think of surfactant within medicine as the biological chemical that's produced inside lungs, that helps reduce the surface tension inside the alveoli and helps keep the alveoli open so that there can be effective gas exchange. But surfactants are actually the name of an entire group of chemicals within organic chemistry that have the shared characteristics of having a hydrophilic head and long hydrophobic tails. We interact with and use surfactants every day in life because surfactants are the main chemical that goes into soaps and detergents. And so you can think of the biologic surfactant that we have in our lungs as being a type of soap because chemically speaking, they're the exact same. The reason all of this is important is because of how the water interacts with the surfactant if it gets down into the alveoli. So if you think about what would happen if you take some water, mix it with some chemical detergent, and then agitate it, 
you'd expect to get a large volume of thick looking bubbles. And that's the exact same thing that happens inside the lung during a higher grade or more severe drowning. We call this when it happens during a drowning, we call it foam. And this foam can be quite dramatic and it can be very large in volume. It can actually fill the entire lung and then it can come up through the larynx and into the upper airway. And it can be seen in the mouth during the resuscitation. So if you're not familiar with it and you don't know where it comes from, it can be very distracting and it can derail resuscitation attempts. So it's important to understand what it is and where it comes from. And we'll talk about how to manage it in the second half. And individuals who have an ongoing submersion, after about one minute of not breathing, they tend to lose consciousness. And then if the submersion continues, after about 10 minutes, they go into cardiac arrest. During that 9 to 10 minute period of time where they're unconscious but still submerged, the larynx is still protected by that laryngospasm, but the swallowing reflex is intact, which means that individuals who have a prolonged submersion over those few minutes, they will continue to swallow water into their stomachs and they can get three to four liters of water in their stomachs during the submersion. Knowing this means that we can predict that up to 90% of patients who have had a prolonged submersion are going to vomit during their subsequent resuscitation. Patients who do have uh, an ongoing hypoxia will have a predictable series of arrhythmias that happen. The first arrhythmia we see in patients during a drowning is a sinus tachycardia. But as the hypoxia progresses and starts to affect the cardiac tissues, this progresses into a bradycardia, and then eventually the patients have a PEA arrest. Importantly, neither ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia are hypoxic arrhythmias, which means that during a primary drowning, especially in those young patients who we don't expect there to likely be another medical issue at play, we do not expect to see shockable rhythms in patients who are in cardiac arrest. Moving on now to the management of patients who have had a drowning, the important thing to keep in mind throughout this is that drownings are primarily hypoxic events. So all of our treatment needs to be focused on reversing hypoxia. And the way we're going to do that is focusing on the same two things we always do, increasing FiO2 and providing PEEP or positive pressure ventilation. If patients are in cardiac arrest, we need to recognize that this is likely a hypoxic cardiac arrest. So we need to incorporate ventilation and oxygenation into our management. This is not the time for compression-only CPR. In fact, some guidelines recommend giving five full rescue breaths before starting compressions in CPR of patients who have drowned. As part of maintaining oxygenation, we want to maintain the airway. And as we mentioned earlier, we expect that patients who have had a prolonged submersion are likely to vomit. So we need to anticipate that and be ready to manage vomiting if it happens. But while we recognize that vomiting is common and we need to be ready to suction out the airway if it happens, we also need to recognize that foam needs to be treated differently. Again, foam, this surfactant washout, can be very dramatic looking because it produces thick looking white bubbles that can be very large in volume. And if you haven't seen it before and you're not sure what it is or where it comes from, the natural instinct is to try and suction it out of the airway. But in fact, this is the wrong thing to do because if we're seeing foam in the upper airway, it means that the lung is literally full of it and it's starting to overflow up into the mouth. And if we suction it out of the airway, it's going to be immediately replaced from more foam coming up out of the lungs. And we're going to end up in a cycle of just continuously suctioning this foam and while we're suctioning, we're not going to be providing high FiO2, and we're not going to be providing PEEP. So it's actually going to distract us from the key thing that we need to do to manage these patients well. We also know now that foam is primarily made up of surfactant, which is actually made in the lungs. And so foam is not toxic to lung tissue. So the appropriate thing to do if we see foam is to ignore it, and just start providing positive pressure ventilation and bag it back down into the lungs. One of the classic teachings around management of patients who have drowned is that we need to assume all patients may have a C-spine injury and apply universal C-spine precautions. But it turns out that this actually isn't true. The best evidence we have for this comes from a review in 2001 
that looked at just over 2,200 drowning victims. And they found that across all these patients, only 11 of them, or just under 0.5%, actually had a C-spine injury. And all 11 of these cases, there was both a concerning mechanism and clinical signs of a neurologic injury. So they weren't subtle and they wouldn't have been missed. C-spine immobilization is not a benign intervention, especially in patients who were focusing on airway management and trying to reverse hypoxia. And so C-spine collars can actually impair our ability to do the thing we most want to do for these patients. So the current direction is that patients should not have universal C-spine precautions applied, and they should only be used in patients where either the mechanism or the clinical signs are suggestive that there could be a neurologic injury. One of the other classic teachings on the management of patients who have drowned is that we would need to consider whether they had drowned in salt water or fresh water. And the thinking behind this was that if they drowned in fresh water, that might cause hematologic or electrolyte abnormalities that we would have to consider as part of our resuscitation. The evidence for this teaching came from some small studies that were done in the 1950s down in Texas, where they simulated drowning with a canine model. But From what we now know about drownings and how they occur in humans, we know that the models they used were physiologically flawed and did not actually represent what happens in the human body during drowning. And we know from looking at actual drownings that there are not hematologic and electrolyte abnormalities, no matter what type of fluid the individual drowned in. So that's not something that we have to concern ourselves about or we don't need to change our management around Things that we do want to do during our resuscitation is we want to get a chest x-ray and an ABG on all patients. And in patients who are having severe respiratory symptoms, we're going to anticipate that they're going to need some form of mechanical ventilation. These are patients who we're seeing foam in the upper airway. We're seeing them have increased work of breathing, or we're seeing some signs of hypotension. These patients are going to have increased work of breathing for about 48 hours because that's the amount of time that it takes for the body to regenerate surfactant. And they're not going to be able to maintain their respiratory effort for that long. So if you see patients with a significant respiratory symptoms, you should anticipate that they're going to need intubation and mechanical ventilation within the next few hours and start getting ready to set that up. Once we've focused on the hypoxia and we're starting to reverse that, We want to take some time to consider whether there is a primary medical issue which contributed to the drowning. So all patients at a minimum, especially those with a decreased level of consciousness, should get a glucose check as part of their initial set of vital signs. And then other investigations for potential medical contributing causes should be ordered based off of the patient's demographics, their past medical history, and the situation surrounding the presentation. A couple other quick myths in terms of the management of patients who have drowned. Historically, some patients have received diuretics as an attempt to try and pull some of the fluid off of the lungs and help with their respiratory symptoms. But this doesn't work, and it does promote hypotension. So there's no evidence it has the likelihood to cause harm, and diuretics should not be used. Corticosteroids have not been shown to have any benefit, and so their use is not indicated. And empiric antibiotics should also not be used. The thinking behind antibiotics is that, especially in outdoor natural bodies of water, we know that there's very high levels of microorganisms in this water. And so some patients were receiving antibiotics as a way to try and prevent pneumonia from developing. The evidence shows that empiric antibiotics do not decrease the rates of pneumonia, but they do increase the rates of resistant organisms contributing to the pneumonia. And so again, there's no evidence of benefit, and their use may cause harm by promoting resistance. The last thing to talk about is ECMO. In the last couple of years, some centers have started using ECMO to help manage the hypoxia in patients who are otherwise being mechanically ventilated but still have profound hypoxia. ILCOR put out a review last year in 2022 of all the studies available to date on this topic, and they found 14 studies to include in their review, but 13 out of the 14 were case studies. So these are very small numbers of patients we're talking about, and the quality of the evidence isn't great. Some of the factors they found that were associated with survival to discharge in patients who received ECMO for drowning were profound hypothermia, which they defined as a core temperature of 26 degrees centigrade or less, normal potassium, 
and for the patient was not in cardiac arrest at the time that ECMO was initiated. At this time, there are no guidelines from any organizations on drowning specific indications for ECMO. And so its use can be considered on a case-by-case basis and in consultation with the ECMO providers at your local or regional center. So that ends our short, deep dive into the management of drowning. Just to quickly circle back and touch on the key points again. We started off talking about the terminology to use around patients who have drowned and the fact that you can have both fatal and non-fatal drownings. We talked about the fact that drowning typically happens in a trimodal distribution and what to look for and what to expect in terms of the cause of drowning in each of the three groups. We talked about the pathophysiology of drowning and got into the definition of surfactant washout and the production of foam. In terms of the management of drowning itself, remembering that drowning is primarily a hypoxic event and so our management should focus on reversing hypoxia and we're going to do that with high FiO2 and by providing PEEP. We're going to be ready to manage the airway, manage vomiting if it happens, but we're not going to get distracted by foam and we're going to keep focusing on effective oxygenation and just bag foam back down into the lungs. Universal C-spine precautions are not indicated and will only apply a C collar if the patient has a concerning mechanism or some clinical sign suggestive of a C-spine injury. And in patients who have profound persistent hypoxia despite being mechanically ventilated, we can consider the use of ECMO.